A recent study published global average temperatures from the last half a billion years. That encompasses almost the entire history of complex life on Earth from trilobites to dinosaurs to us. And today I'm joined by a climate scientist, Dr. Adam Levy, who not only has a PhD in atmospheric physics from Oxford, but also runs an amazing channel called Climate Adam here on YouTube. Hi there. My channel is dedicated to explaining the latest science and insights that you need to know about climate change, from what's happening today to what we can expect in the future, and of course, what we've seen in the past. And if you want a more comprehensive overview of this new study and its importance, go check out the video we did on Adam's channel, which will be linked below and at the end. Meanwhile, in this video, we'll focus on answering two major questions. One, how did these researchers reconstruct temperature on ancient Earth so many millions of years ago? And two, what caused these massive temperature fluctuations through time? But before we get into all of that, you know what I'm about to say, why do we care? Well, as Rachel has said many times before, the past is key to the present and the future. Climate scientists have learnt huge amounts about what we're in store for by studying ancient climates. This not only helps us understand why the climate changes, but what happens to the atmosphere, to oceans, to life when it does. And studying how temperatures have changed in the past also helps scientists pin down what we call the climate sensitivity, telling us how hot we can expect the world to get in the future, depending on what we get up to over coming decades. So studying our ancient climate isn't just fascinating, it's also fundamentally important. But for a long time, our go-to ancient temperature record was from a 2008 study, the famous Zakos curve, which only went back about 66 million years. I know, only, right? But the authors of this new study have created a detailed reconstruction of Earth's global average surface temperature over the last 485 million years. And they aren't just guesstimating. These temperatures are reconstructed using some of the best geochemical data and climate modeling techniques that we have. And this brings us to our first question. How do we reconstruct temperatures on ancient Earth long before humans were around to measure it? Well, thankfully, something else was around taking those measurements for us. Rocks. Rocks preserve physical, chemical, and biological signatures called proxies that tell us about the conditions in which they formed. Climate scientists use all sorts of proxies, like ice cores, fossilized corals, and ocean sediments. Ancient records like these are key to our understanding of our climate's distant past, teaching us how our atmosphere's composition has changed, how the ocean's pH has varied with fluctuations in atmospheric chemistry, how oceans have risen and fallen as ice sheets spread and contracted, and, like in this study here, how temperatures have varied. Physical proxies are things like sedimentary structures, like cross bedding that tells us about the wind or water flow direction that deposited those grains. Or grain textures, like roundness. The rounder the grain, the longer it traveled before it was deposited, compared to more angular grains. Essentially any physical feature of the rock that tells us about the conditions in which it was deposited. Biological proxies are things like fossils, which tell us about the life that was around in the environment in which that rock was deposited. But chemical proxies are the ones that we'll focus on for this video. Chemical proxies are essentially aspects of a rock's chemical composition that result from very specific conditions. For example, trace element enrichments and isotope ratios are commonly used as chemical proxies. But what exactly does this mean? How does it work? Well, let's start with oxygen isotope ratios, which are a very popular proxy for ancient temperature. Oxygen has multiple stable isotopes, including oxygen-16 and oxygen-18. Isotopes are just atoms of the same element with a different number of neutrons. So for example, oxygen-16 has eight protons and eight neutrons, and they add up to make 16, hence why we call it oxygen-16. Whereas oxygen-18 has eight protons and 10 neutrons, and thus we call it oxygen-18. And the reason we call these isotopes stable is because they do not decay over time like the radioactive ones that we use for geologic dating or determining the age of rocks. And because they remain stable over time, 
their ratios in rocks change depending on their mass, not time. For example, oxygen 18 is heavier than oxygen 16 because it has two extra neutrons. And when your entire mass is dependent on your protons and neutrons and you're a relatively light element, this makes a big difference. So how do we use them to approximate temperatures in Earth's past? Well, in reality, it's a lot more complicated than I'm about to explain it, but in a very simplified sense. All the water or H2O molecules in the ocean contain either oxygen 18 or oxygen 16 at a known global relative abundance. And because those containing oxygen 16 are lighter, they will preferentially get evaporated more than the water molecules containing oxygen 18. So when temperatures are higher, more oxygen 18 containing water gets evaporated compared to when temperatures are cooler. In other words, during periods of higher temperature, the oxygen 18 to 16 ratios in the ocean are lower than during periods of lower temperatures. Now, you may be thinking, But Rachel, evaporation isn't the only process in the water cycle. Rain is also a thing and it all goes back to the same mixing pot, right? Not necessarily. Remember that stuff that forms at the poles during cool periods? Yep, that's right. Ice traps a lot of the light oxygen 16 at the poles during cool periods, causing the global ocean oxygen isotope ratio to change due to global temperature changes. Okay, so this explains how oxygen isotope ratios in the ocean change with temperature changes, but how do we measure that? Ancient ocean water isn't getting preserved, is it? Well, when organisms like mollusks, sponges, corals, foraminifera and conodonts build their calcium carbonate and or calcium phosphate shells and skeletons, they take oxygen from the ambient water to do so. And if they get fossilized, they preserve the ocean's oxygen 18 to 16 ratio from the time they were formed. So a lot of the ancient temperatures that we've reconstructed come from oxygen and other isotope ratios preserved in fossils which represent the ancient ocean ratios. Of course, it's not quite that simple. We also have to account for a lot of other factors that might affect these proxies, such as changes in ocean chemistry over time, which is still an active area of research. That was the area of my PhD research, was trying to figure out how changes in ocean chemistry of all sorts, like pH, oxygen concentrations, and all these things can affect the preservation of proxies in the rock record. But that's why this study is so exciting. They didn't just use raw proxy data. They combined it with climate models using a method called data assimilation, basically a smart statistical fusion of model simulations and real world data. Now, climate models are vital tools in climate scientists' belts. We want to ask lots of questions about how our climate would behave in different situations, like what difference it would make if the continents were in different positions, or what would happen if we massively changed the makeup of the insulating greenhouse gases in our atmosphere. <laughs> like that would ever happen. Now, of course, we don't have a spare planet we can do these experiments on to find out. And so climate scientists build model Earths instead. Not physical <laughs> models like this one, but computer models to simulate these different situations. These models simulate the processes that we know are important for our climate. The movement of the atmosphere and oceans, the water cycle, how heat enters and escapes Earth. And then these models can give insights into how these things shift as conditions, like the makeup of the atmosphere, also shift. So these models aren't perfect, of course, but they can help us piece together answers to particular questions, like what happened over the past half billion years. But in addition to these oxygen isotope data and models, they used several other geochemical proxies to corroborate their temperature reconstructions, which we don't have time to cover in this video, but comment down below if you'd like me to cover each of those in future videos. Because each of these proxies record temperature in a slightly different way, the authors were able to get very well-rounded reconstructions of Earth's past temperatures. But wait, how exactly did they assimilate these data with models? Well, they built something they're calling 
FANDA, the Phanerozoic Data Assimilation Temperature Record. They used a technique called the Kalman filter to constantly update their model with the best available geochemical data. They integrated 85 time slices from 485 million years ago to today, covering periods like the late Ordovician glaciation, the Carboniferous Ice Age, the Cretaceous Hothouse, the Paleocene-Eocene Thermal Maximum, and more. Data assimilation is a technique that is actually used all the time for weather forecasting, where you're constantly combining the data you have of what's going on with the computer simulations you have of how weather is developing. And this combination gives you a better weather forecast than either observations or simulation could give you on their own. This study is groundbreaking in that it uses this approach not to look at weather, but to look at changes to climate, the patterns of the planet's weather, over hundreds of millions of years. The computer simulations allow the researchers to take the proxy data, which is just from particular sites, and then work out what was likely going on with global temperature patterns. By going from the local data to the global picture, we're able to get this incredibly complete detailed history of our planet's temperature. And of course, it can never be exact. The researchers provide a range for their answers. But this really goes to show what you can achieve by combining the best simulations and the best observations of our planet's past. Because this technique corrects for biases in both the models and data, it produces a statistically robust estimate of Earth's temperature through time. They found that over the last 485 million years, Earth's global average surface temperatures have ranged from about 11 to 36 degrees Celsius, or 52 to 97 degrees Fahrenheit, a much wider range than previous estimates. This is because previous records were just based purely on proxy data, and because proxy data is coming from the oceans, which heat and cool slower than the global average, those records had a relatively reduced range of temperature variation. But since this study uses data assimilation to get to the global average temperature, the range it shows is far larger. And it turns out that Earth spent way more time in warm climates compared to cold ones. In fact, Cold house states like today with ice at both poles only made up about 13% of this almost half a billion year period. They also identified a strong pattern of polar amplification where the poles warm faster than the tropics due to surface reflectivity or what's called albedo. In other words, when ice melts, the darker surface it exposes absorbs more sunlight leading to even warmer temperatures, more melting and so on. And we see this polar amplification effect today as well. But the most pronounced trend in this data is the relationship between temperature and carbon dioxide. So why are carbon dioxide and temperature so closely related? And how has this relationship evolved or changed over the last half a billion years? So carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. Actually, so are lots of other molecules, but there are a few things that make CO2 especially important for our planet. One is that it absorbs radiation right where Earth emits it intensely. And honestly, we should be glad it does, because without this insulating greenhouse effect, our planet would be way too cold for comfort something we've actually understood for well over a century. The second thing that is so important about CO2 is that it can, and does, change thanks to all sorts of processes. Changes in the amount of life on our planet, volcanoes, vaporization of rocks, and, of course, humans burning vast amounts of fossil fuels. All these things can change CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere. That means that when something big changes, CO2 CO2 levels change, which means temperatures change. We see that throughout this half billion year record, and we see it today. This study actually went further and calculated the relationship between CO2 and temperature over the half billion years. They call this the apparent Earth system sensitivity, which they estimate at about 8 degrees Celsius increase per CO2 doubling. Now this is way higher than the 2.5 to 4 degrees Celsius typically estimated for climate sensitivity today. But that shouldn't be too alarming. The two are actually measuring different things. 
This study's estimate isn't taking account of stuff like continental shifts, changes in sunlight, but then is looking over much longer timescales, which involve shifts to ice sheets. So this result is definitely scientifically interesting, but it doesn't mean our understanding of how sensitive our climate is to CO2 is wrong. All in all, this study serves as a pretty stark reminder that CO2 is not just some random factor that contributes to changes in Earth's temperature, and it isn't something that has only become important to our planet recently. It's consistently been the dominant control, as the study puts it, of climate change through deep time. So now we've discussed how we reconstruct Earth's ancient climate, what this new study found, and why CO2 and temperature go hand in hand. But what does all this mean for modern climate? Like, what about these periods in Earth's past that were much warmer than today? Does that mean we don't need to worry? Why? Or why not? For more on this, check out the video we made over on my channel, Climate Atom. I'll put a link to that video up here on the screen and down below in the description box if you're interested. With that, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you over on Climate Atom. Bye! Bye!